snowball. Okay, cool. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to another episode of Prudent Observations. As you can tell, uh, we were not live on Saturday. We were primarily because I was out basket weaving. With the lovely gentleman in my area had dinner, had a good time, and uh, you know, it makes it easy to identify one another when someone's wearing like a meme T-shirt. Uh, nothing, nothing says our guy like a guy out there uh, wearing a Clown World T-shirt. But I hope all of you are doing well this fantastic Sunday, wherever you are and whatever you may be doing. Um, I will have my camera on shortly for you all, um, in part because I have to do a lot of reading today. Uh, unfortunately, I could not find a free PDF version to have on screen, so I guess we're going to be engaging in a little bit of amphibious uh, reading rainbow of sorts. <laughs> um, uh, so... A while back in college, I had read American Diplomacy by the famous diplomat and foreign service officer George F. Kennan, who had lived an extraordinarily long life and a life full of good writing and good opinions on how the world works, as well as how American diplomacy is structured. And we've covered Kennan before on this channel. We've done three streams on him, some on his personal philosophy and works, and then two on his uh, foreign service career and his times outside of working for the United States State Department. And so I thought it would be important for us to cover uh, what exactly American diplomacy actually is. So with that, I figured that we'll just get started. So this is the text. You can get this really anywhere. This is the 1985 updated edition. And it is uh, comprises of six lectures. So I guess for a little bit of context, um, when Kennan left the Foreign Service, you know, um, he was invited by the University of Chicago and other institutions to give a series of lectures on the state and the history of American diplomacy. If you remember from our three-part Kennan series, you'll remember that um, Kennan was probably one of the first modern version of the foreign service officer and diplomat that we know today. It had a major reorganizing in the 1920s after World War I, sort of centralizing the foreign service authorities. And afterwards, um, he was one of the first men to do so. And after his lengthy career in foreign service and his time exiting out of the post-World War II administrations, especially for his positions on Russia, uh, he was offered a series of lectures. And these are meant to cover the history of American diplomacy. And we, I plan for the next couple of weeks to cover these while at the same time um, prepping some research on some larger projects and lectures for you guys. Like I said, I want to give you guys quality work. I don't want to do anything half-cocked or half-assed. So um, we're going to talk about something that I think is very important and which is, I think, a very seminal text for us to read. Um, so on the back here, uh, which I'll read from you all, uh, there are two real big things to take away from these lecture series, but they're also a very important piece of historiography for the United States and its foreign policy. But it says, um, our diplomacy for the first five decades of this century, the 20th, uh, and our reactions to very different problems have assailed us since 1950, both reflect realities much deeper than our own specific responses of either period, namely the lack of any accepted enduring doctrine for relating to military strength or political policy, and a persistent tendency to fashion our policy towards others with a view of feeding a pleasing image to ourselves rather than to achieve real and desperately needed results in our relations to others. So I feel like that criticism still applies pretty close to home today. Uh, we still love to sell a lovely image of ourselves uh, to ourselves, whether that be through media, our um, public relations offices, or more specifically with our own State Department, whether that's on the uh, lens regarding the progress flag being uh, put up by Secretary of State Anthony Blinken and U.S. embassies across the globe as we sell this nice image to ourselves that we are the land of opportunity and progress, 
while the same criticism being that our policies are not really long standing, they don't have any concrete length or period of distance. We sort of plan out for every scenario and we are very reactive. We are not proactive in our policy for anything long term. Uh, I think our criticisms that hold up pretty well. And um, I'm also doing this series for you all because I want to write a much more lengthy, in depth uh, essay for you all. So today, uh, the plan is to go over the original 1951 forward after these lectures were given and this book was published. And then we'll be covering the first lecture today, which is covering um, the United States' history, specifically within the Spanish-American War and our growth outward into uh, global power. So let's get started with uh, all that right now. So we're going to skip past the 1985 forward uh, in part because... I did not find too much uh, of use for recording it with you. I think it's important we get the uh, the first one, put us ourselves in the context. It's 1950. After many years of official duty in the Foreign Service of the United States, it fell to me to bear a share of responsibility of forming the foreign policy of the United States in the difficult years following the Second World War. The policy planning staff, which he was the first chief of, as we've covered in the Kennan series, it was my duty to set up this office and through its first years of its existence to direct it. It was the first regular office of the State Department to be charged in our time with looking at problems from the standpoint of the uh, totality of the American national interest, which, of course, Kennan's got a lot to say on the national interest, in part because he's the guy that started it. He is the founding of the policy planning office, which still exists today in some form or fashion. And in doing so, um, as we've covered in the Kennan series before, this was a man who knew the outside world better than his own country. He was had staunchly anti-democratic views. He was much more of a um, more racially conscious than some of his peers. And he was sort of the, the guy that had been the reader of everything. When he had first gotten started in meeting with other diplomats, he could quote uh, Gibbons, you know, uh, decline and fall of the Roman Empire, almost, you know, chapter and verse if he needed to with regards to his understanding of historical events. And in turn, he was also a huge fan of Russian literature, uh, knew Pushkin's work quite well, as well as countless others, which made him sort of the go-to guy for Russia, which someone had famously said he wrote, knows Russia better than he knows his own country. Um, but, you know, he set, starts off this forward with a very direct and very confessional understanding. As he says, it, is, it was this realization of the lack of an adequately stated and widely accepted theoretical foundation to underpin the conduct of our external relations, which aroused my curiosity about the concepts by which our statesmen have been guided in recent decades. After all, the novel and grave problems which we were forced to deal seem large measure to be the products and outcomes of these past two world wars. The rhythm of international events is such the turn of the century seemed a suitable starting point for the examination of American diplomacy and its relation to these two great cycles of violence. Uh, one, half, uh, one of the half of these decades elapsed between the conclusion with the war with Spain and the dispatch of the open door notes on one hand and the outbreak of World War I on the other. Measured against what we know and the relationships between cause and effect of great matters in international life, this is a respectable period of time and the influence of our country as powerful as the United States would one day become. And so throughout this forward, and this, this is a transition now, of course, into the lecture, is, is that Kennan is well aware of what has happened in the last 50 years. Specifically, as he'll open up in the beginning of the lecture, that the United States had a great sense of national security, not in the post-9-11 context of it, but the idea that one never had a sense that their home was to be violated, perhaps in the same way that you might feel comfortable to unlock your, leave your doors unlocked in a particularly high trust neighborhood or living outside in the woods very far away from everywhere else. And of course, a series of international events would shake the American polity and by extension, it's foreign diplomacy to where we are now very much insecure. We are constantly reacting and that all that we do has forced and thrust upon us the history of American diplomacy to be one on the international stage and departing from these formerly isolationist point in time of our history. And Kennan will make it very clear in the history of American diplomacy that our first great steps outward into the international stage are with the Spanish-American War. Um, as we've covered previously, though, on this channel, um, in my series or in my uh, lecture discussion with Christopher Sandbach on the history of Crow Doctrine, I don't think you could really start there without taking in serious consideration of the Monroe Doctrine. 
Uh, for instance, as we commonly associate with it, it was sort of a policy to keep out European states and um, potential colonization efforts outside of the Northern Hemisphere, and that would fall inside the protectorate of sort of American military and capital interests, of course, at the time, backed by a very strong relationship with British trade interests at the same time. But um, during, say, James K. Polk's administration in the 1840s, he also wanted to use the Monroe Doctrine as an avenue for the defense of colonists in the Yucatan Peninsula, primarily white colonists, which had ushered in a very strange debate in the history of the United States House of Representatives. What was the original intent of the Monroe Doctrine? And in fact, there were letters, because Monroe was still alive at the time, as to what that could mean. Although how much we would know about it, well, Monroe would die during the debate. However, it illustrates that so much of our foreign policy is still predicated on these much older concepts of our relationship to the rest of the Northern Hemisphere, and by extension, the Americas. Even now, more recently, we had then Secretary of State John Kerry uh, during Obama's second term famously say that the Monroe Doctrine is a thing of the past, which has been very interesting to see if that will come up again in this upcoming cycle of great power competition between the United States and the Chinese, in part because the Chinese have a vested interest in South America, as well as within Mexico and CELAC and Canada. But again, I'm getting ahead of myself. So let's start with the war with Spain and this lecture there. And I will read selected sections. We're going to talk about them. I highly recommend that you get a hold of this text yourself. Um, but if not, do not worry. We are going to cover each lecture on this channel. Um, probably not back to back to back, but my plan is to go through all six lectures. So he starts off and he says, Half a century ago, people in this country had a sense of security vis-a-vis -vis their world environment. And I suppose no people had ever since the days of the Roman Empire. Today, that pattern is almost reverse. Our national consciousness is dominated at present by a sense of insecurity greater than many people of the Western European states who stand closer to and in a position far more vulnerable to than those in the main source of our concern. Now, much of that change may be, and doubtless is, subjective, a reflection of the fact that in 1900, we exaggerated the security of our position and had an overwhelming sense of confidence in our strength and our ability to solve problems Whereas today we exaggerate our dangers and we have a tendency to rate our own abilities less than they actually are. But the fact remains that much of this change is also objectively real. In 1900, the political and military realities were truly such that we had relatively little to worry about in regards to fear in the immediate sense. Whereas today before us, the situation which, I am frank to admit, seems dangerous and problematic in the extreme. And to which he's going to highlight where this metaphor, uh, <laughs> metamorphosis or, comes from, and primarily because it is the growth of America's position on the world stage. And what really sort of acts as the uh, important springboard, I would personally argue it's uh, the Mexican-American War, because it secures the continental United States and access to um, California in a way that doesn't have to bypass, um, you know, to the, getting access to the Pacific and fundamentally weakening the Mexican state below South. But that's just my personal opinion. Um, and to which she says on the international stage, we start getting involved with European powers. And so we're going to continue. Um, and as he explains all this, you know, we had rose above our dependence from the British Empire. This had allowed us to become incredibly safe inside our own continent. This allowed us to address the domestic issues moving westward into the country, especially after the Civil War. But his focus is that our first real change of foreign policy the last 50 years is going to start with the Spanish-American War and where that puts the United States at the um, start of the century. So... Uh, now we see these things, or we think to see them, but they were scarcely yet visible to the Americans of 1898, for those Americans had forgotten a great deal that had been known by their forefathers or a hundred years before. They had become so accustomed to the security that they had forgotten it had any actual foundations outside of the continent. They mistook our sheltered position behind the British fleet and the British continental diplomacy for the results of superior American wisdom and virtue and refraining and interfering and the sordid differences and affairs of the old world. And they were so oblivious to the force portents of change that where they were destined to shatter that pattern of security. And in the course of the ensuing half century, they were, of course, exceptions. Brooke Adams, Henry's brother, um, probably came closer to any American to his day of a sort of intellectual premonition of what the future had in store for us. But even he caught only a portion of it. He saw the increasing vulnerability of England, the increasing e eccentricity, he called it, of her economic position, 
her growing economic dependence on the United States, and conversely, the growing strategic dependence on the United States on England. He sensed the ultimate importance of the distinction between sea power and land power. Now keep in mind, towards the end of the uh, 19th century, we also have the infamous text, Alfred Thayer Mahan. I mean, every, this is a quintessential text that you have to read, the influence of sea power upon world history, wherein much of our doctrine on naval power today is still predicated on those texts over a century old. The emphasis on how sea power had evolved from being littoral and coastal or river-based to where now you can study the histories of the fights between the Persians and the Greeks, the Romans and the Carthaginians, and now more so within the Civil War and today. Um, <laughs> it's a BoomerCon copes about World War II episode. I hate reruns. I, I doubt this is what you're getting out of George F. Kennan. And in fact, he's going to be more heavily emphasizing where we had gotten wrong in World War II and by extension, the Cold War. I highly would recommend reading the Kennan series because he is not so much the... Uh, I guess what people like to say, the boomer truth or sort of this post-World War II regime out of it and all. And in fact, even in his later writings, he was very critical of American adventurism and our understanding of the world abroad. Uh, Kennan sort of acts as this nice uh, companion piece to Paul Gottfried's um, anti-fascism, a global crusade, uh, which is well worth reading on your own. So yeah, you're not you're not you're not getting that at all here at this one. I promise you that. Um, Kennan, of course, is fundamentally liberal, but also has plenty of reactionary tendencies and is not a big fan of democracy. So I would recommend if you haven't seen the series after this one, go to there. Uh, but we'll continue on. Their efforts were not even followed up by those at the time or in years after it was immediately ensued with the war, especially because of, um, he's referring now to, to Mahan's understanding of how sea power would impact the United States and its history to the rest of the world, especially because those inside the American government, especially that of like Brooks Adams and others, as he notes, talks about the growing rise of other European powers as well, specifically along the lines of the rise of Russia, and also the industrialization of a then uh, unified Germany. And so uh, Kennan highlights that a lot of the American intelligentsia, a lot of the American political powers that be at the time, were not paying as much attention as they were, but there were a notable few that did. Um, and that America's economic and security dependence on Great Britain was not subject to, to last forever. And in fact, the debate over economic interdependence has been a long-standing debate inside foreign policy circles. And in fact, we're seeing those theories be tested out right now, at least in regards to uh, the war in Ukraine. It is plain for this reason that the incident I am talking about today, our brief war with Spain in 1898, occurred against a background of public and governmental thinking in this country that was not marked by any great awareness of the global framework of our security. This being the case, it was fortunate that both the situation out of which the war arose and, for most part, the events and consequences of the war itself were largely local and domestic in their importance. As we proceed with these lectures and advance into the 20th century, we shall see the global implication of our pre predicaments and actions growing apace with the passage of the years until the case of the Second World War, and they are positively overwhelming. But at the time of the Spanish-American War, they were hardly present at all and the taking of the Philippines was the closest we came to them. And if a war so colorless from the standpoint of our world relationships is worth discussing at all this afternoon, it is because it forms a sort of preface to our examination of diplomacy of this half century. A simple, almost quaint illustration of some of our national reactions and the ways of doing business, and a revolution of the distance that we were destined to have come if we were ever to be a power capable and being able to cope with the responsibilities of global leadership. Um, and I think that, and this is something that also Radlib and Ryan Turnipseed have talked about, sort of their history of the United States as a political power on the world stage, is that this really does kick off with the Spanish-American War. And Kennan is absolutely correct. One has to understand where our focus had been since the end of the Civil War, at least in regards to the federal government. I'm not referring to Reconstruction. I'm not referring to locally. I'm referring to the international stage. At this time, there is a great period of American expansionism. Um, both moving westward, you're seeing a greater industrialization of the um, New England areas alongside the Midwest. You're also beginning to see a large influx of Irish and German immigrants, primarily the Irish that came over during the war. Um, let's not forget that hundreds of thousands of Irishmen, you know, were basically, you know, recruited to fight Lincoln's war and for the North and for the Union. 
and in turn, um, you know, they moved westward, part of our greater industrialization and expansion to our relationships with China and others out there. And in doing so, but most of America's politics were focused inwardly. The issues of how can we move our industrialization? How can we speed along the fact our rail systems, our electricity is beginning to grow apace for us? And at the same time, the focus outside the international stage was very limited. Um, and Kenan notes that regardless of how the war with Spain actually starts off, whether it be by our own um, issues of proper ammunition storage, or if there actually was a Spanish sea mine, we are finally thrust abroad in the world stage in a way that fundamentally changes our thinking from now on. America is no longer the place to get away from the affairs of the old world. The warnings of Washington are no longer as present as we once hoped that they would be about foreign entanglement and moralizing alliances. Although, in George F. Kennan's career, he had adamantly warned that the United States should not be as dependent upon moralizing institutions, specifically the United Nations. Um, Kennan was one of the few kind of our guys of his time. Um, our war with Spain, as you will recall, grew out of a situation in Cuba. It was one of those dreadful, tragic, and hopeless situations which seems to mark the decline or exhaustion of a colonial relationship. We have seen other such situations since, and some of them not so long ago. Spanish rule on the island was being challenged by Cuban insurgents, poorly organized, poorly disciplined, but operating on the classical principles of guerrilla forces everywhere and enjoying all the advantages of guerrillas operating on their home territory against an unpopular foreign enemy. You know, <laughs> uh, one has to pause and just think about how that applies to some other things I've seen in our lifetimes. The Spanish attempts to suppress the insurrection were inefficient, cruel, and only partly successful. The situation had been long developing, and it had been growing um, sporadically for decades. President Ulysses S. Grant summed it up very well in a presidential message to over two decades earlier in 1875. Quote, each party seems quite capable of working great injury and damage to the other, as well as to all the relations and interests dependent on the existence of peace on the island. But they seem incapable of reaching any adjustment, as both thus far have failed in achieving any success by one party shall possess and control the island at the exclusion of the other. Under these circumstances, the agency of others, either by mediation or intervention, seems to be the only alternative which must sooner or later be invoked for the termination of strife. And Napoleon is in Spain, too. Tale as old as time. Absolutely. Back in 18... Uh, well, I mean, that's even earlier, but, you know, we're dealing with 1875, unless you're referring to, like, the other issues inside Mexico. <laughs> um, but there had been some improvement, to be sure, of course. I mean, um, this would, you know, teeter on for decades. But, um, of course, what we have in 1896 and then 1897 uh, begins to change. And Kennan is very quick to talk about McKinley's government and his understanding of international relations in the world stage finally begins to take a look at what's just immediately outside of our backyard, um, not looking far off into, say, Japan or China and our growing relationship with them, or, of course, dealing with um, the exploration of Alaska, but more specifically, the Gulf of Mexico and right outside Florida. In his message to Congress in December of 1897, President uh, McKinley noted this improvement of relations between the Cubans and the Spanish and recommended that we give this new Spanish government a chance. I shall not impugn its sincerity, he said, nor should impatience be suffered to embarrass it in the task it has undertaken. Certain difficulties, he said, had already been cleared up, and there was reason to hope that with patience and our part of continued goodwill on behalf of the Spanish government, further progress might be made. However, in the year of 1898 began, with renewed hope and the plight of the Cuban people might get better instead of worse. Unfortunately, two things happened that winter which changed the situation quite drastically. First, the Spanish minister to Washington wrote an indiscreet letter in which he spoke slightly of President McKinley, calling him a bidder for the admiration of the crowd and a would-be politician who tries to leave a door open behind himself while keeping on good terms with the jingos of his party. This letter, of course, leaks. Uh, rather famously, this is the uh, open door letter, which causes significant uh, strain of relations between the new Spanish government and McKinley's administration. And then, of course, um, the uh, American battleship, the USS Maine, which had been sunk in Savannah Harbor for reasons that are still debated to this day, which had led to the loss of 266 American souls. And which, of course, as we kind of famously know with William Randolph Hearst and the others, um, sort of a jingoistic yellow journalism takes place and in turn calls for war and for action come to mind. 
Um, there was a, a made for TV series. I think it was on like Turner classic movies, but it, it's about, you know, the rough writers. It's got a two parter. It's got some well-known actors in it. And there's always a part in that film. This is a slight digression. I apologize, but it's relevant since we're talking about the Spanish American war, but it talks about these like young twenties age men that are looking at the news and the declaration of war. And in turn, um, they said things that you just don't hear today whatsoever. And I get it that it's a film, but there was sort of a noblesse oblige of an earlier era that is far gone. It was these young men uh, of wealthy sort of New Englander and industrialists. And they had said that it is the responsibility of sort of the patrician class to lead the plebeians into battle. And these were all like young, idealistic young men that were going to be officers and lead the charge. You can't help but think to yourself, well, damn, I wish <laughs> I wish that what we had still believed in something like that. But alas, we don't. Now, uh, Ken continues on. Um, now, it looked at in retrospect that neither of these incidents seemed to have been adequate cause in itself for war. The Spanish government could not help its ministers in discretion. Even diplomats are constantly being indiscreet. This sort of thing happens in the best of families. It promptly removed him from his job and disavowed his offensive statements. And as for the main, there has never been any evidence that the Spanish government had anything to do with the sinking of the vessel or that it would have had anything but horrified at the suggestion that it would have anything to do with it. Um, Kennan, of course, is very familiar with regards to um, being in, <laughs> having indiscreet statements leaked to the press. Um, it's the reason why he had sort of lost his ambassadorship to Russia. He had made comparisons to the security and the uh, lack of transparency from the Soviet government, uh, very akin to Nazi Germany in the Second World War, which the Soviets were not happy with at all and promptly asked for his removal. And before he was even really assigned to Moscow, he had lost his position, um, which we've covered in the Kennan series before. But it's not like he is uh, certainly unfamiliar in this regard. Um but nevertheless, he continues, it seems to be the judgment of history that these two incidents so affected the American opinion, let's not even begin to talk about the press, um, of the, the inevitable sinking of the Maine. From what that time, no peaceful solution was really given serious consideration of the American government. This is particularly significant and unfortunate because during the nine weeks that intervened between the sinking of the USS Maine and the opening of hostilities, the Spanish government came very far in the direction of meeting our demands and desires. It came so that by April 10th, 11 days before the war began, our minister in Madrid, a wise and moderate man who had worked hard to prevent the outbreak of war, was able to report that if the president could get from congressional authority to deal with the matter at his own discretion, he could have had a final settlement before August the 1st on one of the following bases. Um, the autonomy to, to acceptable insurgents, independence, or cessation from the United States. And on the same day, the Queen of Spain ordered a complete armistice on the island and the Spanish minister in Washington promised our government the early proclamation of a system of autonomy such that no motive or pretext is left for claiming any fuller measure of war thereof. These, of course, are isolated snatches out of a long and involved correspondence between our two governments. I cite them only to indicate on paper, at least, the Spanish government was coming around very rapidly in those early days, of April 1898, to the sort of attitude and action that we would have been demanding of them. Yet despite all of that, one finds no evidence that the United States government was in any way influenced by these last-minute concessions. It made no move to prevent the feelings and actions in Congress from proceeding along a line that was plainly directed towards an early outbreak of hostilities. So yes, hello to everyone in chat that's brought in. Welcome, everyone. And as um, Radlib and Ryan Turnipseed have covered in their history of the United States as sort of Proclamation as a world power. They, of course, start in the, um, of course, the uh, Spanish-American War as well. And one of the things that they talk about is the influence upon uh, the press to the American people, but also that there were plenty inside of the uh, Congress at the time um, that really wanted to go out of their way and have a war. <laughs> And in doing so, I mean, they put themselves in a, in a position where there was no real political capital that McKinley could spend otherwise to get it, despite numerous efforts to sort of get negotiations and concessions from Spain to stop fighting the insurgency, sort of pull out. Um, of course, the Queen of Spain had ordered for armistice at this time between the Spanish government and the Cubans, but nevertheless, um, hostilities begin. Now, it is true, as the people then saw it, that many of the Spanish concessions came too late and were not fully dependable. It is also true that the insurgents were by this time in no frame of mind and in no state of discipline to collaborate with any way with the Spanish or American authorities. 
But one does not get the impression that these were things which dictated our decision of our government to go to war. This decision seems rather attributable to the state of American opinion, to the fact that it was the year of congressional elections, the unabashed and really fantastic warmongering of a section of the American press, and to the political pressures that were freely and bluntly exerted on the president from various political quarters. Uh, it is an interesting, in fact, incidentally, that the financial and business circles, allegedly the instigators of wars, had no part in this and generally frowned on the idea of our involvement in hostilities. Well, how much of that I would claim to be true, I think, requires further investigation with these Arcanon's words. But those three factors are incredibly important. Uh, when do we often get wars? In times of political concern, primarily when we're running for re-election. Um, when there is significant calls for blood in the press, we must refer back to famously Walter Littman's public opinion. We live in pseudo-realities. People rely on an expert class to tell them what to do. And if they tell them that war with Spain is good, regardless of whether or not they can find Spain on a map, so be it. And of course, the exerting pressures and the difficulties that an American administration might have when it comes to political capital. One such example that might serve as a modern inverse of this example, of course, would be Barack Obama's pr uh, pressures, of course, to get more involved uh, inside of Syria in 2012. He had numerous things that were sort of writing on him. One, the public opinion of the press saying that another war at a time when the president was campaigning to be sort of the ender of wars didn't go so well. Um, the political exigency, exigencies, which would, of course, put sort of pressure on the administration, primarily Russia's interest in Syria, specifically the port of Tartus and the Bashar al-Assad government. And then, of course, finally, the man's running for re-election. Sometimes it will go in your favor. Um, most of the time it won't. So depending on what you may actually want is the quote-unquote most powerful man in the world, you have limitations. Um, and Kennan is kind of quick to point this out. How much I would believe that business interests or financial capital isn't particularly interested in getting their hands in Spain or other Spanish territories, I'm a bit more skeptical, um, maybe in part because I have read Wars <laughs> Racket and things like that. Um, the upshot to all of this, as Kennan continues, is that on April 20th, uh, Congress resolved that it is the duty of the United States to demand and the government of the United States does hereby demand that the government of Spain at once relinquish its authority and government in the island of Cuba and withdraw its land and naval forces from Cuba and Cuban waters. And it directed and empowered the president to use the entire land and naval forces of the United States to such extent that it may be necessary to enforce that requirement. We gave the Spaniards a three-day flat ultimatum for compliance with this resolution. We knew that they wouldn't, could not accept it at all. And so that early following the morning, the Spaniards, without waiting for delivery of the ultimatum, declared the resolution an equivalent to the declaration of war and broke relations with the United States. On the same days, hostilities were inaugurated by the United States government, and thus the United States and the accompaniment of great congressional and popular acclaim finally inaugurated war with another country in which the situation had only been said that the possibilities of settlement were exhausted and all measures short of war were by no means available to the ordinary member of government. And, of course, Kennan has always been an advocate for restraint and looks back at his own time working in his foreign uh, service. And, of course, you know, diplomacy prior to Kennan being part of the foreign service, which had been significantly reorganized in uh, 1919 to be a more modern uh, aspect of it all, and he was one of the first members of this new Foreign Service Office in 1923 after he graduated from college, uh, sort of being this guy that did not come from an aristocratic class, in fact, came from Wisconsin, definitely not where we would see our uh, landed or wealthy gentry of Englanders going to Ivy League schools. Uh, however, nonetheless, he'd be one of the most influential of the uh, 20th century, and even to today, his work still influences us in 2023. So, you know, since a century, since he's started doing his work, But of course, war begins, and here we go. But we're already kind of seeing Kennan's, you know, critique settle in, that we didn't allow diplomacy to play out the way that it did, but we're also realities, we have to face the realities of political and diplomatic pressures, both from the outside world with other states, but also how it appears in the American press. Um, our democracy of 1896 is nothing at all like the democracy of um, 2023. There was for what little accountability we have today, there was a little more accountability, or at least easier ways to levy pressure based on who voted uh, to do so. 
Um, but, you know, that's more or less how Kennan describes the origin of the war. Um, and so, of course, at the same time in 1898, April uh, 20th, uh, this resolution was passed, basically going for war. Um, but yet only 11 days later, after the war had started, of course, Admiral Dewey sails into Manila Bay in the Philippines in the early hours of the morning um, and attacked and destroyed the Spanish fleet there. And of course, by the time that uh, the war had really been started off, the Spanish fleet in the Philippines was not aware that war had been declared. Uh, to a point that, um, you know, Admiral Dewey orders ships to be fired upon. Um, you know, they had originally had thought that uh, this was some sort of welcoming display and had requested ammunition uh, in order to do the same backwards. Uh, so in turn, of course, this victory was, of course, uh, complete. Uh, the reduction of Spanish power in that quarter or to um, order in the security of the islands while in the possession of the United States. This force made the, to the Philippines and went into action there. By August, it stormed and took the city of Manila, and this effect of the action was to later constitute the most important and probably decisive consideration in our final decision to take the islands away from Spain and put them under the United States flag entirely. For this military operation shattered Spanish rule in the islands and made it impossible for us to leave them uh, to, leave them to Spain and left us, as we shall see shortly, no agreeable alternative but to take them ourselves. So again, we're kind of seeing some, you know, by nature of what we've done, it was fate accompli. You know, these things are set in stone. These things have happened. The die has been cast. And we are left to sort of take over the Philippines. And in doing so, uh, the United States also has to deal with its own fighting of, um, you know, Filipino resistance with inside the country after we had taken it. They had gone from basically one colonial power to another power that really didn't have a, a strong authority in colonial administration to now take over it. And thus fighting had broken out shortly after the Spanish American war. Um, but Kennan continues. Um, the fact of the matter about why all this happened down to the present day, we do not know the full answer to the question as to why all this had to be. We know a number of things about it. We know that Theodore Roosevelt, who was the young assistant secretary of the Navy, had long felt that we ought to take the Philippines, that he wrangled Dewey's appointment to the command of the Asiatic fleet, that both he and Dewey wanted a war, and that he had some prior understanding with Dewey to the effect that Dewey would attack Manila regardless of the circumstances of the origin or the purpose of the war. We know that President McKinley, in defending Dewey's actions at a later date, showed a very poor understanding of what was really involved and professed to believe a number of strategic premises that were simply not true at all whatsoever. McKinley had indicated that he had thought of taking the Philippines at the time of the Battle of Manila and that Dewey's actions was designed to destroy the Spanish fleet and eliminate it as a factor of our war with Spain. But if this were true, we were still mystified as to why President McKinley authorized the sending of any army to, to occupy the islands within a few days of Dewey's victory. We are not sure what we really know has passed between the government in Washington and Dewey prior to the battle. And we can only say it looks very much, though, and if this is the case, that the action of the United States government had been determined primarily on the basis of very able and quiet intrigue by a few strategically placed persons in Washington, an intrigue which has received absolution, forgiveness, and a sort of public blessing by the virtue of war hysteria, of the fact that Dewey's victory was so thrilling and so pleasing to the American public but it's ending in the rigors of a severe and extremely unpleasant congressional investigation. You know, the uh, very able and quiet palace intrigue of a few strategic uh, individuals in Washington, I'm very much reminded of our current crowd today. Um, and it, uh, it kills me a lot in that regard, because I think of people like Victoria Newland, Anthony Blinken, and of course, uh, late Secret or former Secretary of State um, John Kerry. Yeah. Yeah, they did send a follow-on force, um, and they wasn't initially to occupy it, but we ended up doing it anyway, the circumstances that left it there. Um, and uh, yes, Michael Smith, I have a degree in political science with a focus in international relations and another degree in uh, U.S. history. I, I double majored in college. So the answer to that question is yes. That's what I studied. I'm well past my undergraduate years. Um, if I were to go back, I would basically be like Avenue Q singing, if I wish I could go back to college. <laughs> Those kids are so much younger than me. <clears throat> but the debate over the war was long and voluminous. 
Much was concerned with legalities, but these were not the real issue. The real issue was an expediency in that of wisdom. The proponents of expansion advanced a variety of arguments. Some said that it was our manifest destiny to acquire these territories. Others said that for one reason or another, we had a paramount interest in them. Still, others maintained that we should, as an enlightened and Christian nation, have a duty to regenerate their ignorant and misguided inhabitants to evangelize them. Others argued that it was necessary for the defense of our continental territory. And finally, it was alleged by the commercially minded that we had to take them, Hawaii and the Philippines in particular, to assure ourselves a fitting part what was regarded as the great trade in the future in the Orient. The opponents of expansionism argued partly in legal terms, challenging the constitutionality of such arrangements, but most of their most powerful arguments were those asked by, um, by, right, uh, by what right we Americans, who had brought our country into the existence on the thesis that governments derive their just powers from the consent of the governed, could assume the rights of empire over other peoples and accept them onto the system, regardless of their own feelings, as subjects rather than as citizens. To annex foreign territory and govern it without consent of its population, said Senator Hoar of Massachusetts in the course of the debate over the ratification of the peace treaty with Spain. Should we be utterly contrary to the sacred principles of the Declaration of Independence and find this all unconstitutional because it promoted no purpose of constitutional government? The founding fathers, said the senator, had never thought of their descendants would be beguiled from these sacred and awful verities that they might strut about in their cast-off clothing of pinchback emperors and pewter kings, that their descendants would be excited by the smell of gunpowder and the sound of guns from a single victory as a small boy by a firecracker on some 4th of July morning. Um, and, you know, I find... Again, this is a history look at what the United States used to be, what we used to venerate, what used to be the old American civic religion. Today, nowadays, that's normally worn as some kind of skin suit by our political opponents. No one reads the Constitution. Um, and no one reads, uh, you know, I mean, Senator Congressman McCarthy of California can read the entire Constitution on the House floor. But who does that regard its interest into? Who actually buys into it? Well, we know regularly that government is abused by the simple fact that if the rules got you to where you are, what purpose was the rule, to borrow from Cormac McCarthy? But one does certainly have to ask, at what point in time did these principles stop mattering? And I think we can break that down based on the basis of, one, the growing international need to face our opponents, which Kennan will talk about later throughout his lectures, that our constitutionality and our war-making abilities have been greatly overridden, the constitutional need about declaring war and congressional authority, in part because nuclear weapons have become so prolific and we're still being proliferated everywhere during this time. And then, of course, secondly, is that we have our bureaucratic means and ends, and, of course, the famous clause by any means necessary with regards to um, securing what Congress needs to get done. And so in doing so, we see these debates play out even to this day, although the old right of the early 1900s, 1920s, and 30s that uh, are often labeled as isolationists um, both in terms of slander, but also as a self-described position by some, will argue time and time again um, that this is not our place, either for legal reasons, but some, like uh, Senator Hoare of Massachusetts, that we have no responsibility to do so. It's rather a Burkean argument that who are we to change the rights of those that are dead, alive, and have yet to be born? It's not their inherited right for them to be usurped by others. But again, that doesn't uh, exist in that regard anymore. But nevertheless, uh, Kennan continues, um, and he cites one of his favorite writers of all time, Anton Chekhov. Uh, the Russian writer, Anton Chekhov, who was also a doctor, once observed that the large variety of remedies that would be recommended to the same diseases um, of our, uh, <clears throat> the same diseases of what we had to deal with, particularly that inside of uh, the Philippines and later in Cuba, um, you know, that there was a variety of such of these diseases were curable. Similar, however, during our arguments about colonialism and expansionism for the territorial acquisitions of 1898, one of them has the impression that none of them were the real one, that the bottom of it all lay something deeper, something less easy to express, probably the fact that the American people of that day, at least many of them more influential spokesmen, simply liked the smell of empire and felt an urge to range themselves upon the colonial powers of the time, to see our flag flying on distant tropical islands, to find the, and feel the thrill of foreign adventure and authority, to bask in the sunshine of recognition as one of the great imperial powers of the world. 
but by the same right of retrospect, one is impressed with the force and sincerity of the warnings by the anti-expansionists and the logic that is yet never fully really refuted of their contention that a country which traces its political philosophy to the concept of social compact has no business taking responsibility for the people who have no place in that concept and who are supposed to appear on the scene in the role of subjects, not citizens. Kings can have subjects. It is a question of whether or not a republic can. And certainly I do feel like that question has been answered. At least by force. A republic certainly can have subjects. Although whether or not I can call the American Republic today a republic, that's certainly up for debate. Some would like to say oligarchy, others, who knows. <clears throat> but in this debate that he's now going off on, and this is all after the fact, we tend to usually shoot first and then ask questions later, as with all things in American politics since the turn of the 20th century, even to today. Um, one remembers in particular the words of one of the anti-imperialists, Frederick uh, Gukin. The serious question for the people of this country to consider is what effect will the imperial policy have and um, will have upon ourselves if we permit it to be established? It is primarily in the light of this question that one thinks about our subsequent experience with the colonial possessions. About Puerto Rico, I can't say, Kennan says. Recent events have surely been eloquent enough to cause all of us to ask ourselves whether we really have thought through all the implications of a relationship so immensely important, so pregnant with the possibilities for both good and evil, as the colonial tie between our country and the people of Puerto Rico and the case of Hawaii, we will see the outcome of the decision as a relatively successful one. But only, I fear, because American blood and American ways were able to dominate the scene entirely. Because of the native way of life was engulfed and reduced, as was the case with the American Indians, to the helpless ignominy to our tourist entertainment. In the case of the Philippines, we can only recall a few years after their annexation, and the first and most eager protagonist after their acquisition, Theodore Roosevelt, was already disillusioned and was already repenting for his initiative and wishing we could be rid of the Filipino people. So, again, sort of a shoot first, ask questions later type policy. And of course, this is in 1950. This is before Hawaii is admitted to the Union, or still tentatively the Continental 48, um, before Alaska and Hawaii are added. But these things do illustrate a rather interesting point of view of our slice of history of this time. Um, even to this day, most of our American interventionism is taken relatively for granted, or it is simply passed along to the anti-war others. Um, I was having this discussion with uh, on the Digital Archipelago on my channel earlier this week, wherein there was an individual said on Twitter that, oh, excuse me, that a lot of the anti-war protesters of 2003 probably wouldn't have had a problem with the war in Iraq or Afghanistan by large extension um, if someone other than George W. Bush was in the White House. Historically, I don't know how true that would be, um, and it feels like a rather post-hoc interesting discussion because, well, what happens? Bomb administration, the war significantly escalates. We then have to deal with the Islamic State. And, of course, throughout this time, the last 30 or so years of American history, there has been an interesting post-Soviet policy with regards to Ukraine and other former Soviet bloc states that indicates that there is always this idea of what we could do. Uh, what kind of expansionism can we achieve? And then deal with the implications at a much later time, often when individuals are not in the White House. Similarly to how President Biden has signed several laws about things that take place in 2025, whether or not he will be in the White House, most likely he won't, let's pray. Even if he is, he'll still have opportunities to change it. Um, but, you know, this first lecture illustrates the changing of political opinion inside the United States the emergence of an imperial power, the differences that exist between here and now um, in, in regards to our foreign policy. There are still plenty that wish to view the United States as someone that should not be play, taking a major role, but now it's been thrust upon the American people today. Um, there are plenty of us that are still adamantly anti-war or at least anti-interventionist, but at the same time, realistically speaking, in an age of great power competition, much in the same way as of the concert of Europe, a balance of power must be maintained. And that requires global thinking, not just the once formerly um, you know, Anglo-Protestant American view that we are here to escape the troubles and the trials and tribulations of the old world. But in a time when someone is young, even civilizationally like that in the late 1800s, a taste for blood often comes with 
terrific and terrifying consequences. And I think to a large extent, we're still seeing that today. Uh, we've been thrust upon with empire. And secondly, um, we now have to deal with those consequences, whether we like it or not. Um, the question becomes, how well can that empire be maintained in the midst of change in demography? But that is a discussion, I think, for a later time. But um, as we get towards the conclusion of Kennan's lecture, and I'm not reading the whole thing bit by bit, I certainly think that um, we're going to hit some of the main aspects here. But, uh, you know, he, he argues this. When it came time to employ our armed forces, popular moods, political pressures, and intergovernmental intrigue were decisive. President McKinley did not want war, but when the bitter realities were upon him, there is no indication that either he or his Secretary of State felt in duty bound to oppose the resort to war if this was the advantageous for them for the standpoint of domestic politics. Having resorted to war for the subjective and emotional reasons, we conducted it in part on the basis of plans which, as far as we know, had never been seriously examined and approved by any competent official body, which were known to and understood by only a tiny handful of individuals in the government service, and which obviously reflected the motives ulterior to the announced purposes of the war as defined by the United States Congress. And when the success of the naval and military operations that flowed from these plans inflamed the public imagination and led to the important questions of the acquisition of foreign territory, the executive branch of the government took little part in the debate. It made no serious effort to control the effects of popular reaction to the exploits of a popular commander far afield. It was only the obligation of the Senate to ratify treaties and caught the tremendous issues involved and brought them to the attention of the public and a senatorial debate as measured and as enlightened as any were ever to be had. To my mind, it seems unlikely, in the light of all of this retrospect, that the conclusions which triumphed in the debate were the right ones, but we should not let that constitute a reproach to our forefathers, for we are poor judges of their trials and predicaments. Let us content ourselves with recording that in the course of their deliberations, they stumbled upon issues and problems basic to the health of our American civilization, that these issues and problems are ones which we still are before us and we still require us to answer, and that whereas the men of 1898 could afford to be mistaken in their answers to them, our generation of today has no such luxury. And I think that that last paragraph is very clear. Um, we today have no such luxury about answering the questions or being able to make mistakes in regards to um, the wars that we fight into. Um, and in such, uh, I think that one of the things that we certainly have to deal with in this part here is, is that we can't afford the luxury of making mistakes. And of course, this is in 1950. So this is one year after the uh, Rosenbergs had been given access to the bomb to the Soviet Union, although there were plenty of spies that were there during the project in Los Alamos, and which is why during, of course, the uh, conference in Iran about the war ending in the Second World War, um, when you know FDR and Truman would later talk about the issues of the bomb itself, Stalin didn't seem surprised. Um, and of course, all these things sort of play out the, the way that they have um, since then. Um, whether we like it or not, um, the events of 1898, as Kennan notes, had sparked a civilizational question, one that is an existential question to the American people. Of course, the America of 1950 is way different to the America of, 19, uh, of 2023. And in turn, we're now dealing with significant consequence. From the Spanish-American War, the United States has thrust itself upon the world stage, the seizing of territories, and in turn, from 1898 onward, we had more or less engaged in about 30 or so years from 1898 to 1929, when the Great Depression hit, of various interventions inside Central and Latin America, um, whether that be in Mexico and various other countries, the creation of the Panama Canal and others to sort of support this global position we sort of had to react very quickly that all these debates had taken post, you know, um, you know, post facto, it was ad hoc in response to what had already taken place. And in doing so, that's something that we still see today with regards to the American government. Will we still look upon the consequences of say our visit to Taiwan or our visit to China in 1972 and wonder what kind of situation that puts in us. And even now after our full uncommitted or fully committed support to Taiwan, whether that be by, you know, the former Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, visiting in the middle of the night and morning over there, to now where we've thrown out and basically torn apart the Taipei Accords of 1972, our relationship is fundamentally different. We have individuals talking about a potential war by 2025. War games have been played out by the Center for International and Strategic Studies. 
All these things to me illustrate that we ourselves have taken the conclusion that Kennan has said that we have to plan out for every mistake because we cannot afford to make them. And that's why our policy, as he'll criticize in the next five lectures after this, and its history of our diplomacy, has always been constantly reacting and trying to sell ourselves a good image. The press is tantamount to this. Um, we can see that today with today's conflict, or even earlier as a more, I guess you could say, historical example, although it feels much more recent, uh, with the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, whether that be um, Jessica Lynch being turned into sort of like the female Rambo, or um, Storm and Norman, General Schwarzkopf in the first Gulf War. All these things come to mind that we try and um, illustrate the reality that people do want to be fed a more healthier image of themselves, a positive jingoistic nationalism. Again, uh, what nation doesn't want to see itself be the victor on the world stage? We see it all the time. But uh, Kennan, being a part of a more modernized uh, foreign service, a uh, foreign service that has seen some reform since his days, but has definitely, um, you know, still structurally very much similar to the one that he uh, lived in and served in and commentated on for the rest of his life, uh, even prior to his death. Um, in the early 2000s, uh, he had a his um, you know he hired his uh, biographer like in the 1980s, and um, you know thought that, that he wouldn't live much longer than that and live for another 20 years. Certainly interesting in that regard. But um, Kennan's first lecture highlights that you know despite the administration not wanting war, the consequences that led to it had then thrust upon existential questions of what the United States is to be. And I think that that question was actually answered much earlier because what did arise right after that? Well, we had the first and the second world war. Uh, the first world war, of course, was campaign on sort of a process by President Wilson to not necessarily get involved with the uh, Lusitania and the Zimmerman telegram, of course, would change that. And then in the second world war, there was a great pressure, both from the first world war, but also the great depression to focus inwardly, focus on the domestic and in doing so, not get involved once more in far-off European affairs, especially by the memories of the First World War, and by greater extension, our intricacies and adventurisms abroad. The taste had soured on it. In fact, that used to be sort of a progressive position, um, the sort of anti-imperialist one. Although even then, the, what would be progressive for the 1890s, um, even in 2023, would sound probably radically to the right. Well, those sort of things did emerge into an old right space, um, you, uh, rise of empire, sort of like the last essay that Garrett Garrett wrote in the late 1950s after the Korean War, um, demonstrates that what we had done as, you know, we've became one um, for better or for worse, but if we're going to do it, we should probably do it what's best by our principles. And even then that sort of has fallen apart. Um, but that is sort of the uh, first lecture. I try and keep these sort of discussions and readings to about an hour. Um, so, uh, if you have, if you, uh, I'll stay on for a little bit, of course, so you have announcements, uh, frog of the week, and then, um, uh, plenty of news for you all. And then I'll catch up with entropy and any super chats that you have sent off. So if you would like to, the entropy link is pinned in the description. If you don't want to give Susan money, I wholeheartedly, well, Susan's not in charge anymore. It's some, uh, Indian gentleman whose name escapes me. So, um, and we have two Indians running running for president now. It's uh, I can't wait for the caste discourse to enter um, the mainstream public opinion. But uh, for now, what I will do is um, <laughs> get to uh, where we're at. Uh-oh. What do you mean? Someone telling me Gino, Gio is gone? Uh-oh. Not good. Is he really? Sorry. You, you've now just informed me of... He's here. What are you talking about? He's still on Twitter. Goodness gracious. Anyway, so we're going to get started now with um, uh, announcements, and then we'll get to Frog of the Week and all that other jazz. So we're going to go to Share Audio tab. Um, there we go. Share Slideshow. So I've actually got a lot to uh, tell you guys about. Um, so there's plenty of things to do here. Uh, oh, where's G? Oh, well, G Every Thursday, it's on Thursdays. This is what I do every Saturday, but today it's Sunday because I went basket weaving yesterday. But anyway, so on to the announcements. Um, 
Uh, I'll be recording with Scott Mannion uh, from his uh, Greenwood and his YouTube channel on Friday, the 24th. I don't know when it will be up, but I am recording with him on that day. Uh, on the 15th, so this coming Wednesday, I'll be on Oren McIntyre's channel. We sort of scheduled that out to sort of talk about the editing of books and popular culture, whether that be uh, Roald Dahl or um, R.L. Stein in right regards in that respects. Um our good friend Luke Avery over at Lambda Bible Studies will be hosting his uh, second annual uh, Lambster. So he covers uh, all sorts of interviews and culture and politics and Christianity during the uh, Paschal Tide, our, our Easter and Lenten season. So I will be on there um, on the 28th. I will be the last person on for that day in the evening, my time, um, nighttime for those overseas and the, the wonderful aisles across the pond. And uh, I will be talking about... Um, uh, Christianity in that respect. And then um, Patron Book Club will resume next month. We just covered and finished off uh, Oswald Spangler's Man and Technics. So we uh, have that going on for us. Next month will be on uh, Birch, um, not, not Bertrand de Juvenel, the other uh, well known French thinker, um, Joseph de Meister, will be covering some of his essays on sovereignty, courtesy of Imperium Press's Collected Works collection, which you can go purchase over on their website. Highly recommend them. Uh, great access to books and writings of great reactionary thinkers. I was also, um, earlier last week, I was on Unpopular Opinions on Academic Agents channels. So if you didn't watch that, you can hear my takes on American diplomacy, as well as the ongoing, um, you know, Matt Hancock files that have been talked about on The Telegraph. And then I was also on Jay Burden's channel. Um, we had a fun discussion that felt a lot more like insider baseball, but it was still a very good time. And then this Monday, I will be um, with a gentleman by the name of Anthony of Westgate. He's uh, more of an orthodox writer, but he has a podcast called The Reversion. And I will be recording that on Monday. And then right after we get off today, um, there will be an early uh, screening and viewing of the um, Real Talk, which I have going on for you all. Um, and there's also the uh, wonderful YouTube shorts if you guys didn't see that one. So um, see subscribe star after today's show. Be sure to check your inbox. And after that, uh, my main pro uh, project afterwards is really going to be focusing on getting every single video uh, that I have on this channel in audio format uh, on places like Podbean, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts. The accounts have been made. I just need to start uploading um, and focus on that. And then from there, um, I will have uh, some more lengthier essays coming out on Substack very, very soon. Um, I've been enjoying uh, the writing that we've got going on. Um, be sure to be very careful about where you put your money with regards to banks. I hope that none of you all are secret Silicon Valley tech bros. I apologize if you lost your money. But uh, let's face it, fellas, it feels like 2008 all over again. But... Um, Let's get to Frog of the Week and end this on a very good and happier note, shall we? I love this in the comments. Frogs will never be broke. That's so true. Anyways, uh, this week's frog of the week is the Venezuelan pebble toad. As you can see right here, he is a very small boy, barely an inch long, snout to rear, and that's primarily the females. They are endemic uh, to the eastern Tepuis Mountains chain inside of Venezuela. It's the only place that you can find them. But because they are so incredibly small and they've got sort of a uh, rough back, they can easily not only match within their environment, but they uh, will curl themselves up into a tiny ball, and then they will just roll off the rock. So they will literally be like a pebble and just fall down the mountain. Very based pebble. Um, its dark coloring, of course, enables effective camouflage um, against predators. You can primarily find them in highlands where the rocks can be found, um, and they will usually go down to peat bogs in order to mate. 
Um, they are an excessively uh, vulnerable species, primarily just due to birds, but they also have to deal with large spiders as their uh, predators, primarily tarantulas and others inside that region. They are also likely to be eaten by other larger frogs inside the area, so they certainly have quite a lot going for them, but hopefully they can simply, you know, cast themselves off a mountain and do what is necessary that they need to survive. So that is uh, this week's Frog of the Week. Um, and for those complaining that it's a toad, all toads are frogs, but not all frogs are toads. I will always go off on that technicality, but you will never run out of frogs and toads to love on this channel. So um, now I get to catch up with all you lovely people uh, in chat and say hello and how you guys are doing. Um, but first, I need to thank our top tier patrons who donate $20 or more a month on Subscribestar. Uh, this includes Fearless Leader, Raging Mandrel, Preservatism, Focron, User 4A, 5B, 5DB5, Consumer, Cowering Bugman, Hunger, Winston Fujimori, Voluble Ox, and more recently, um, Flavanius, who has also joined the uh, wonderful Rainfrog tier at $20 a month. So, these wonderful people are uh, help keep the channel going. There is still a wonderful sale on merch with the promo code PRUDE um, over on the wonderful uh, Teespring store that I have for you guys. So if you want uh, a wonderful mug like the, the one that you see here on camera, you know, you're just here for a frog of the week. Um, you can get 10% off with that promo code. It will go until this coming Saturday, the 18th. So you've got a lot going for you. Um, not to mention there's Buy Me a Coffee and Substack. So whatever you guys, if you're a supporter on Substack, you get access to the same stuff on Subscribestar, which is usually um, essays or um, recordings that I have in mind that will be exclusive for a while and things like that. Um, yeah, sure, Jan, right? You know, you got to, it's promo code PRUDE, 10% uh, off. You can find the link down below in the description for the merch store. Um, you've got mugs, you've got journals, phone casts, all sorts of stuff. Um I had been informed over the uh, Christmas holiday that uh, user, our, our, our good friend Hunger, um, who was on here, they were they had a Chinese gift exchange and someone had given them the uh, Edmund Burke socks, but Edmund Burke has a Pepe the Frog face. So those are still up there. So those are a lot of fun. Someone's got them. They're out there in the real world, as are the mugs. So uh, by all means, enjoy. But now I got to catch up with you all. I will check... Um, and scroll through chat and see if I had missed any super chats or anything like that. But no, um, until then, I can probably answer some questions from you all. But <laughs> hey, look at that. Prince of Parma actually sent something that wasn't in um, uh, in, <laughs> in South African Rand. So you, you've got that going uh, for us all. Um, so I, I find that kind of funny. Um, but yeah, so one of my... Uh, favorite um he, he asks me do i have any favorite sea battles of the 1800s um one of my uh favorite um sea battles of course is going to be uh the battle of um the head passes and this is in regards to uh the ironclad warships of the civil war both the United States government and the Confederate government had them. So, you know, fights between the CSS Virginia, um, you know, constructed on the hull of the USS Merrimack. Um, you know, they had a casemate ironclad gunship as she entered the Confederate Navy. Um, and of course, the U.S. government had them. But I mean, they fought quite a bit there as well. I mean, there's also the um, ocean battle of... I mean, they're not the first ones to do it. I mean, that's just the Civil War. Uh, I find that the ironclad to be this interesting step up from uh, wooden warships to now the, the traditional dreadnought. Um, I wish you would ask the 1900s because I actually really like the Battle of Jutland. I, I know quite a bit of that battle and its history. But I mean, also the Battle of Lissa in 1866 is between Austria and Italy. And they also combined um, ironclad warships. And it was like the first time... Uh, they had done so um, out in Europe, but I, I just find that stuff to be really interesting. So I guess really we'd go with, um, you know, battle of head passes and any sort of battle that had come from Confederate and, uh, you know, Union warship battles. But I'm more of like a, an air uh, and more of a, an air battles guy as well. So World War One aircraft battles and dogfights, I know quite a bit about as well, some World War Two stuff. But uh, let's see here. 
Uh, Lieutenant Pilar has sent a few. Um, thank you so much, good sir. I greatly appreciate it. Uh, he says, uh, hopefully going to have a Substack out on it soon, but I'm really starting to like the term global American unocracy rather than empire for several reasons that you can imagine. Um, so it's my favorite uh, It's my favorite meme about, um, I've seen as of late, uh, which has been um, Sheen Estevez from Jimmy Neutron. He's at, he's at uh, Go and Tell. And he's just like, behold, the eunuch slave class. And the teacher is just like, humanity, this is like the seventh century in a row. You've invented the eunuch slave class. And for us, that's like, of course, um, the ongoing trans stuff. So, but I mean, it's a funny term, uh, you know, if you wanted to go that far. But I, I don't know. I'm a, I, I take significant issues with the 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 gae term although i've used it in the past but my, my thought process has always been that uh you know <laughs> make calling it empire is cooler than what it is but yeah i mean i i certainly have issues with it but in part because i think it it doesn't illustrate the fact that ordinary american people aren't really in charge of it <laughs> um and then luthan plor asked for two dollars us do you think that the main was an inside job uh, I've read some arguments to make the case that it was, but I've also, my favorite argument that I've heard that it wasn't an inside job, but rather just, a, um, but also had to do with poor ammunition storage, which had led to it being sunk. There was no evidence for a sea mine that had been the cause of the explosion, but I wouldn't be surprised if somewhere tucked away in the annals of a, of a desk of some person in on it that we may discover, you know, in 20 years from now. Oh no, actually it was an inside job, but um, given the jingoistic attitudes and the fact that the McKinley administration did not want to go to war, I would not be surprised if it was one. But I do think that um, the uh, the explanation for poor um, uh, poor ammunition storage was a, a large case for it all there. Um, yes, I do. Uh, I, I please see all previous real talks. There is always at least one or two catches per video. Um, so yes, John, uh, I, I do quite often. And now that the pond is restored to its former glory, uh, it's a little easier to, uh, to catch fish. Um, the HMS Nemesis is pretty cool and probably a scary ship for the Chinese doing opium war considering it was their first ironclad. Well, now I'm going to go look up the HMS Nemesis. Uh, the Nemesis was the first British ocean-going iron warship. It was the largest of six class of vessels ordered by the secret committee of the East India Company. I really, um, well, on that point, um, uh, Melphis, do you have like a very good book on the Opium Wars? I would love to read more about it, um, you know, because everyone can meme about it to death. But if, uh, if you do have a very good book uh, or recommendation, anyone in chat, if you have a good book on the history of the... Um, uh, the history of the opium war. I would love to read it. Um, so, okay, well, here we go. Uh, Prince of Parma sends a few more. He says, uh, favorite U S military aircraft in the Pacific. So I'm assuming this is in regards to world war two, cause that's one of my favorites. Um, and uh, a favorite carrier perhaps. Uh, well, I have two military aircraft in the Pacific that I thoroughly enjoy. The F4 UD one Corsair, um, it's gull wings and had uh, carrier landing capabilities were fantastic. And then one cannot think about the uh, SBD three dive bomber and the fact that it was considered obsolete really by the time that the war had started, but had still been one of the most successful anti-ship, uh, you know, dive bombers of world war two. So those would be my two favorite as for an, an aircraft carrier in world war two. Uh, I'm not too sure. I mean, I'm not, you know, I don't really think I have an answer to that one, actually. I mean, I, I don't think I would know one off the top of my head uh, that I could tell you in that regard. <sighs> but, you know, it's something for me to think about. Hmm. <clears throat> Prince of Parma, again, for $3 US, says, I think it is correct to call the current US system an empire, as is correct in referring to the Athenian system as an empire during the Peloponnesian War. Well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't ever call the United States not an empire. I think it clearly has an imperial... It's an empire without an emperor. Um, it, it lacks a sovereign. Um, technically, the sovereign is... I mean, I like Schmidt's definition, right? Sovereign is he who makes the... Um, 
the exception, but at the same time, right? Like I don't necessarily know how you could look at the United States and not recognize it as, as an imperial power. It certainly has subjects that it maintains through a hefty means of um, financial uh, satrapies and um, military alliances and significantly is one of the leading contributors to the global economy, roughly 20%. And in doing so, I mean, yeah, I, I wouldn't divorce it from that term either. Even the Athenian definition of empire certainly fits. Um, although it is not a facilocracy. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't, it's not like a, an island-based country. Although some have argued that the U.S. is an island in international relations literature. And I just, I don't buy it. Um, oh, here we go. When the U.S. first went to Korea, they lost their ships to a 300-year-old ironclad turtle ships the Koreans had laying around. Whoo! Um, interesting. I did not know that. Or, like, the Korean War? Really? Hold on. Iron. I, I'm now looking up Korean War ironclad ship. The ironclad turtle. Yeah, okay. They just had one laying around. <laughs> um... Oof. Yeah, a War Memorial Korean Seal. I just looked it up. <laughs> Holy cow, really? Look at that. Unbelievable. <laughs> Tells you to learn something new every day. Um, uh, no, that is not where the, the Putin dollars come from. I don't get any. Uh, but also, uh, Subscribestar is not immune to it. I, I picked Subscribestar when I started doing this stuff to ask for money because... Patreon measures off YouTube or off Patreon conduct of what you upload. And so uh, I think it's something that's just not worth uh, trying to risk it. You know, um, whether the, the people I interact with, the things I say on Twitter, I just don't want to risk, you know, Patreon being like, yeah, no more. So although I wouldn't have a problem opening up. Um, oh, 1800s. Gotcha. Appreciate it. Um, but yeah, no, I don't get any of that. And in fact, even with the... Uh, the war and the sanctions. I couldn't get anyone from Russia to give me money anyways. So yeah, I wouldn't have to worry about that. <laughs> subject to change for $5 US. I like the stream. Uh, well, subject to change. I was, this is how I know uh, I, I find myself in similar circles sometimes is, is that uh, I was going through, I was watching an old red letter media video and it was one I had not seen before. And it's like four or five years old. And I'm scrolling through the comments. And who do I see there other than this, uh, other than subject to change with a, a well-liked couple of hundred likes on a comment on a red letter media video. And I was like, I've seen that face before. I've seen that name before. And it uh, was subject to change on a, uh, on a stream there. Okay. So, uh, and then Prince of Parma for $3 US says, I read and reviewed The Opium War by Brian Inglis, a 1970s era Guardian writer. I can link if you want it. Uh, yeah, Prince of Parma, by all means, please DM me on Twitter with a link. Uh, I would love to see that. And um, I would like to read the text myself because that stuff's really important to me. But yeah, so, um, that's what I have going on for you all fine, lovely people. Um, it's been very busy in regards to me being a guest, but this week I intend to hopefully pull back a little more on uh, the guest appearances besides that one on Monday and Wednesday. Um, and after that, of course, the Digital Archipelago will be on Geo's channel this week. I don't know what we're covering this Thursday. I do know the next week I'm on, which will be the 23rd, um, we will be covering some more movies and we'll be covering a guilty pleasure of mine which is the um, uh, sort of Tom Hanks, Meg Ryan movies of the 1990s. There are three of them. You've got Mail, um, Sleepless in Seattle, and Joe versus the Volcano. We'll cover those three. <laughs> Excess is a liberty. Asian history is one of those things I want to get to, um, but never will. Well, you know, if there is a if there's a book that you really want to enjoy on Asian history, you say you never will, but it's actually, this one was quite accessible. Um, oh, so... Uh, I'm trying to remember the title now, but or actually, let me just look to my uh, <laughs> let me go look towards my bookshelf here real quick. Um, yeah, uh, Autumn in the Heavenly Kingdom by Stephen Platt. It's a relatively recent book. It came out in 2012, but it was a very fun read, uh, a very accessible read on the Taiping Rebellion, which I, I would highly recommend. Um, 
Total War Shogun too. Yeah, um, uh, be be like Michael here and just be uh, just you know Giga Chad your way into understanding uh, world history of um, through video games. That'd be the way to do it. Uh, oh, I she I, found, I don't know if I want to put that on there. I doesn't terrify. It's a terrifying concept. You've got mail. <laughs> it's the trans reboot of that movie. <laughs> uh well, that's pretty damn funny i'm not gonna lie that's great um but yeah we'll be reviewing those three movies on mine because i those it's, you've got mail it's kind of a fun thing to think about in retrospect because it is a man that puts a woman out of business and she falls in love with big brother in the end of it all it's quite entertaining um and so that'll be a fun spicy review um uh, Melfa says, Opium Regimes, China, Britain, and Japan, 1839 to 1952, is the one I found on my shelf in the middle of the night here. I think this one is also that touches on the Japanese drug trade, too. Well, fantastic. Uh, well, let's let's go. Um, you know, also, you know, Univer <laughs> um, Europa Universalis is always a great way to, to learn history if you wanted to. Uh, although, I, how much of your history you're going to learn from Paradox Games... Uh, that's anyone's guess. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> um, like I've said before, I was gifted like two years ago, um, Hearts of Iron 4, and I've never touched it. I'm deeply afraid if I get into it. Because I've, like, I've played Crusader Kings 2, and I quite liked it. And it's a fun way to, to waste a day if you really wanted to. So I, I, I'm terrified if I were to go out and play uh, that. I'd be certainly in, <laughs> certainly in trouble. So I will, I will receive, I will let you all play the, the four X games. I will stick to my sins of a solar empire and modding 20 year old plus shooters. So uh, with that, um, as we get to the end here, barring any, uh, I should start an alt channel where I game. Well, I will be perfectly honest with you Tuesday. I've thought about it. Um, I've written down some plans that I want to do with the channel. Um, uh, which specifically would be in two different areas. One would be religion, um, and then the other would be like a, I guess like what AA does with his friend Morcar. Um, so those would be things that I would recommend. Um, and then are your friend to Kingdom Come Deliverance? Yeah, I mean that's a pretty good game. That was, I, I, I slightly complained on the last episode of the Digital Archipelago that um, I'm very much. Uh, frustrated by the fact that i really have to go to like startups and indie developers but that's just the nature of it all like the long arc of history of gamergate really it has been and will be that the anita sarkeesians and the bright pink hair dyed people of the world won they have their games now and they get neil Druckmann like being real masturbatory over his creations with the last of us and like that's the way that it is and so you're right i will continue to mod like halo custom edition from 2003 until the you know uh till the cows come home or I will play kingdom come deliverance or I will play system shock Two one more time. Um, have you looked into that red? No, I haven't. And I'm not sure I want to. <laughs> that sounds like a terrifying concept unless I get to play as rich Evans. And every time I take damage, he does the, the rich Evans laugh. And there are times I laugh where I feel like I have a rich Evans laugh and that terrifies the hell out of me. But yeah. <laughs> um, one of the things that I would like to do as we get closer to like the decade since Gamergate is that there needs to be like a very well done um, like historiography on it. Like we have so much content throughout the years that detail it. It just needs to be like one singular concise documentary of it, right? Unless it turns into like a Chris Chan documentary where it's like 76 parts. So who knows? You've got the Mike Staclasa drunk grandpa laugh. I have the I I I appreciate Mike Staclasa's um you know old man sort of he's tired with everything, but you know that's my one of my guilty pleasures. Thanks to Sargon, I know who Lori Penny is. Thanks Sargon. <laughs> well, you know I, how much you could thank him for. It's entirely up to each individual. But the one thing that the left was certainly right about was. Uh, uh, was certainly the uh, that is the issue of um, getting people over here. We just wanted to play games, isn't that true? Um, 
you should just play Escape from Tarkov, where all the screen names are too foul to write here. So this is my this is this is why when people have asked me about a gaming channel, the answer is usually no, because I can't ever stream it because I have rural internet and it's already a pain in the rear to stream with the camera on and then with like a like a, a lecture or sometimes I have to turn the camera off when I'm doing streams with Geo just because it's easier for me to actually get you know to hear whatever he's saying. Um, so unless I get like a different internet setup or I, I move to to town, then maybe. But it would probably just be playthroughs and things like that that I do. Um, but Prince of Parma says for three dollars, you could name it More Cars Younger Brother. Like no, I've got like three or four different. Um, here, here's a good example of this. So I've got like three or four different like audio avatars that I that I would use for this. So we've got this lovely guy, one of the Prude Jacks. Um, I have my like private investigator columbo frog um i've got this guy uh and of course since we're you know sneeding and catching up with super chats uh you know this is what we've got here so but i i would plan to have like you know like how academic agent has aa gold i would probably have like prude platinum and you know that'll be places for off-topic stuff or games or religion most likely gaming and then I'd have another channel with respects to religion. But yeah, no, this is how I've got it, I got, got it going for me here. So, but um, we'll go put that back up on uh, screen now. So uh, Prude Platinum is excellent. Well, yeah, I might go for it. Um, even if you can't, uh, tr I'll try the game. I'm certainly not uh, opposed at all, I think, in that respect. Um, I, I find a, a lot of games, fun. like my guilty pleasure is War Thunder. I'm not going to lie. Not because I'm in the military and I can serve, you know, classified documents to the game devs, but I, it's a an, it's an accessible simulator where I can still enjoy things and uh, and do such as that. But I'm going to double check entropy one more time. Okay, we are good. Um, so we will bring ourselves to uh, the conclusion here of what we are up to. And. Um, uh, as always, I like to usually end things with a reading from the good book here at Prudent Observations. So with that, um, we will um, be doing a little bit of reading from James 3. This is the thing that uh, I always keep in mind when I do these streams, because again, you know, teaching is a sort of important thing. I want to give the best that I can give away. So uh, reading from James 3. Um, my brethren, let many of you not become teachers, knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment. For we stumble in many things. If anyone does not stumble in word, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle his whole body. Indeed, we put bits in horses' mouths, they may obey us, and we turn their, um, their whole body to do so. Look also at ships. Although they are so large and are driven by fierce winds, they are turned by a very small rudder wherever the pilot desires. Even so, the tongue is a little member and boasts great things. See how a great forest, a little kindling, uh, a little fire kindles, and the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. The tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body and sets fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and creature of the sea, is tamed and has been tamed by mankind. But no man can tame the tongue. It is an unruly evil, full of poison. With it we bless God our Father, and with it we curse men who have also been made in the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceed blessing and cursing. My brethren, do these things ought not to be so. Does a spring send forth fresh water and bitter from the same opening? Can a fig tree, my brethren, bear olives, or a grapevine bear figs? Thus no spring yields both salt water and fresh. So uh, with that, wonderful ladies and gentlemen, I hope that you all have a very pleasant start to your week this Sunday. Uh, for those of you who are dealing with Lent and the Great Fast, stand firm. Um, we are getting close to the halfway mark. Some of you are already at the halfway mark, depending on your calendar. And with that, um, uh, I will see you all very soon. Um, this Thursday, I'll be on Geo's channel. Uh, and with that, I will probably have the real talk out uh probably on Thursday. Uh, so this means the 16th, but um, patrons will see it early tonight as they get access to see all uh, the new videos early. And if you are already a member on Substack, Subscribestar, or a channel member, you have access to patron book clubs recordings that, uh, so we've just finished um, going over uh, Spangler's Man and Technics. So I'll see you all later on the channel with a new video later this week. Take care. God bless and be prudent, everyone.